Oh All right, everyone, we are going to get started. Uh, welcome to the second and last journey lecture of this semester. And it's my pleasure and delight and honor and privilege to welcome my colleague and friend, um, Professor Sebastian Zollner, to the podium. I'm incredibly delighted that uh, his wife, Brett, and kids are at the back. And so really a moment for the family, a moment for the department, a moment for the community. Uh, I expect schnitzel, I got pretzel. Uh, but, 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 you know, that was Sebastian's choice. Um, not mine. Uh, but we have, like, you know, we have a tradition that uh, we really connect different generations of mentors and mentees to the journey lecture because a big part of an academic's journey uh, are the students. And so we have a home at home, but we also have an academic home and academic children. Uh, so here are two of Sebastian's academic children. Uh, one, Pedro, he graduated last year, is that right? Yeah. Last year. And Alicia, who is hoping to graduate next year. Uh, and so the two of them are going to have the honor of uh, introducing Sebastian. But I think that when I was writing that email that I sent to the department uh, about Sebastian, I nearly cried because I was thinking about all the moments I have shared with Sebastian and all the like, you know, moments when he knocked on my door and asked me, are you doing okay? And all of that. <clears throat> And then two days later, I asked Sebastian that, Sebastian, did you read my email that I sent to the department? He said, no. <laughs> and I put all of that emotion into, into that email and he said, no. So, uh, but, but that's Sebastian, he's honest. But then he went back to his office and he read it. And every single word of that email was so true. But my words are really hardly inadequate. The department is incredibly, incredibly thankful to Sebastian uh, for his dedicated leadership in population genetics, in mentoring of students, in bringing diverse values to the forefront. So uh, I really uh, am very, very thankful as a department chair to have a, such a thoughtful comrade uh, with me and for the last 18 years. So over to Alicia. Hi, everybody. Um, it's my honor to help introduce my advisor, Dr. Sebastian Zollner. For those of you who don't know Sebastian, he is a professor in the Department of Biostatistics, obviously, with a joint appointment in the Department of Psychiatry. He also serves as the co-director of Physician Health at the University, a role that I believe he's extremely well suited for, as he's told me on several occasions to be more polite with my writing and in my presentation. <laughs> Um, but moreover, um, on top of being extremely intelligent and an expert in genetic epidemiology, statistical genetics, and all things population genetics, he is also um, incredibly thoughtful and an intentional person. And the co-director, as the co-director of Physician Health, he's dedicated to ensuring that Physician Health efforts improve many facets of patient care in an equitable manner, a challenging yet important task. Additionally, Sebastian has also demonstrated a commitment to service to the department over the years as he has actively served as a member of crucial committees, including the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, Admissions Committee, and faculty member overseeing the Genome Science Training Program. His commitment to fostering an inclusive academic environment and shaping the future of our department through thoughtful processes underscores his dedication beyond research and needs. Moreover, Sebastian is a mentor dedicated to the success of the next generation of researchers. His students, including recent graduate Pedro, stand as a testament to his exceptional guidance. Um, I'll hand over the mic to Pedro now and he'll share a few words. Thank you, Alicia. Me being a testament of Sebastian's excellence, that <laughs> myself. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm going to go for a little bit more personal here. Um, when Bramar asked me to introduce Sebastian, I've been thinking about what do I say about Sebastian that it's you know not obvious when you meet him. And it's the one thing that is not obvious is that he's not scared. <laughs> um, but also I want to say things that are you know things that aren't unknowingly true. And I thought about 
maybe I can keep it simple and just say the three things that I admire and I think of when I think of Sebastian and his candor, kindness, and integrity. Um, he will always tell you what he thinks, but he always tell you with kindness, and he always keep in mind to be truthful and integrity. It is a very time. Uh, that's the three things that I learned from him through my PhD, other than a bunch of science. <laughs> um, and I'm truly, truly, truly thankful for him. And I just want to say that I admire him so much that I even copy his hairstyle and his. <laughs> I can't wait for your journal return, Sebastian. I was in your lab for five years, and I hope I can get be in your lab for as long as it wants. With more for ado, it's Sebastian. Okay, I don't know that there's anything I can say to top all this, so I mean, it might also. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, Does that work? No. I mean, can you hear me anyway? Oh, but no. Yes, good. good. Excellent. Okay, so um, I have, to, I can start with a quote. This is a quote that, once again, writing this journal lecture, this is a, a quote that everybody who does coalescent theory uses all the time. But also, this is a quote that writing again this journey lecture um, brought it back to me. We're living life forward and often going back and um, synthesizing ideas, synthesizing, thinking about things that happened in the past is what really helps us understand what's going on. Um, one of the things I realized while making this um, lecture is that typically when I talk about myself, I work very hard to keep the communication under 60 seconds so that we get to the point very quickly and either the joke or the main thing that I want to say is done. We'll see how I do with 60 minutes. Um, okay, so here's how it all started. I was born November 20th, 1971, so 52 years old. Um, my parents were, were both medical doctors. Um, my mom is a medical doctor in dermatology. Um, she was born in 1941. Um, she came from a really big family, most of which, uh, right after World War II, emigrated to France. She's a devout Catholic, which affects a lot of her values. And she was a very, she, while running her own clinic in dermatology, she still managed to spend most of her time raising me and my sister. My dad um, was born in 1923, uh, died five years ago, six years ago. Um, and he was quite the towering figure. He was a professor, um, the German term is Lehrstuhlinhaber, and I'll explain what that means in a second, in internal medicine. Um, a Lehrstuhlinhaber is roughly the equivalent of a full professor, except that the position comes with automatically one or two assistant professors that work for you, they're called assistant, as well as a decent amount of funding for multiple grad students or postdocs. Um, so they're basically that each each one of these holds their own small institute in their hands. Um, his er research area was the genetics of gout that was in the 70s and 80s when we didn't have modern genetics uh, at all. And he had a ridiculously long uh, list of honors. He was the vice president of the University of Munich for a while. He was the head of the German Society for Internal Medicine. I, I ran out of space <laughs> rather than add all the things here. Um, so as you can imagine, he was barely ever home, um, as somebody with that much work is. And he was a towering figure. There were weeks when I saw him on TV more often than at home. Um, we had a pretty big family. My dad married twice. So, oh, one more point I wanted to make. Um, most of you will realize uh, both of my parents lived through, or at least in parts through World War II in Germany. My mom was a, a refugee after the war and was basically traveling all through Germany and ended up settling on the border to France. Uh, my dad was a soldier um, in Russia, and only by the fact that he had already had a couple of years of uh, medical training, he was called back from Russia before his entire unit was killed there. So first point where I got really lucky to be here. <laughs> there are more. Um, 
So as I said, big family. My dad married twice, so I have a total number of four siblings, two sisters and two brothers. One other thing I realized while making this uh, presentation, I am horrible at keeping pictures. I did not find a single picture of anything, of practically anything that's older than 10 years. <laughs> Among other things, I don't have, don't have a single picture of one of my two sisters. So here you can see my younger sister, who's my full sibling, as, we, as well as my two older brothers. I don't have another sister. Another thing that made my family a little bit, or maybe not unique, but special is both my dad, as well as some of the French family considered, consisted of multiple people who were sort of in the good sense, classical patriarchs, and they wrote Christmas cards to cousins four times removed, and they kept the whole family together. So we had family parties of 100 people uh -huh. relatively regularly. Um, in my early years, I got I was put into school basically a year earlier than was necessary given my age. My birthday is in November. School starts in September. My parents didn't want me at home for another year, um, so they put me into school early. In school, I was always a solid, but not a great student. Um, I'm reasonably certain in the first couple of years, my teachers were always joking that getting, keeping me to stay in my seat was the biggest challenge. Um, pretty sure somebody back there can sympathize. Um, uh, I was a troublemaker, uh, a little bit of an outsider. As a troublemaker, I had the big advantage. School was not hard for me, so teachers could only lean on me so much. <laughs> um, I moved to the and for those who don't know, Germany tracks students very early. After fourth grade, you're either going on the university track or you're going on the vocational track. Given my background, unsurprisingly, I went on to the university track and finished there with a solid but not particularly impressive body tour. Then the next lucky break in my life happened at the time. So this was 1990. Germany still had mandatory military service which means most of my male peers at this point went to the went and were 18 months, first three months of basic training, and then basically spent 15 months sitting in some barracks somewhere and mostly drinking alcohol and wasting time. Um, did I mention before that both of my parents are doctors? <laughs> so when I arrived for my, um, for my examination for military service, I had a bag of x-rays and expertise, opinions and whatnot, that among other things says, well, there's a couple of pretty bad things, and if they got worse, that would be all the fault of the military. Go ahead. <laughs> I was deemed unfit for military service, <laughs> which saved me probably about two years. Um, um, so for those of you keeping track, I had a life of reasonable amount of privilege. privilege. My both parents, both my parents were MDs, and while in Germany, MDs are paid well, they don't make like lavish riches as they do in the US. They are on the upper end of the economy, but right, it's not, it's not as. My dad was a famous professor, which had good sides and bad sides. Um, for example, if I want to give you a bad side, my sister also went into medicine. In her, I think, third year, she went into a room. From her description, I wasn't there, probably twice as big as this one twice as many students. At the beginning of class, the professor stands up and says, I hear the daughter of famous Professor Zollner's in the audience. Could you please stand up and make yourself an opener? <laughs> she never went back to that class. <laughs> um, another, what I think is worthwhile as a privilege, we had a harmonious, huge family, so big support structure, and it was just lucky. Nothing really bad ever happened to me. Um, after I did my uh, my abitur, which allowed me to study anything, um, I decided to become a student in mathematics in the LMU, which is one of the two major universities in Munich. Um, in Germany, mathematics, they don't put any GPA cap on you. Anybody can go and study mathematics. And if you're still there after half a year, you're actually supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. Half of the people are not there after half a year. Right, because they start with this is what addition is. In eight weeks, they are this is what are the back integral is. Um, so um, it go it moves really really fast, and if you can't keep up, that's great. And if you can't keep up, you're probably better off somewhere else. Um, I minored in genetics, which was another one of those lucky breaks. I went into math, and when you did math, you did, did have to have a minor. The typical choices were physics, computer science, or meteorology. The people who didn't want to work too hard all took meteorology. That wasn't me. 
physics and computer science and math sounded too much one path for me. So I said, genetics sounds cool. I had no idea about genetics. I don't know really the absolute basics idea. So I did a bit of minor in genetics, which was mostly about prokaryotes. So it got me an idea, but it's not that similar to what I'm doing today, but it was useful. In 1997, I graduated with what is the equivalent of a master's. Um, the German term is Diplom Mathematica. Um, my um, thesis was on nonlinear analysis on light functionen, which is fundamentally, and this might be the extent to which I remember it, uh, a property that describes how solvable differential equations are. Mm -hmm. So it's something that looks at the inner product with differential equation formulations of differential equations and tells you something about their solvability. Um, again, I did well enough, but I didn't do that well. Most of all, though, I knew when I had my master's, this is all the math I want to do. <laughs> and this is not because I didn't like math. But I found that even during my master's thesis, while I was sort of in the deep weeds of it, it was me and the equations. If I wanted to even talk to my advisor, I would need to go there and explain for him for about half an hour where I was, what the small steps are, and where the next problem is. So communicating about what I was doing was next to impossible, was, was really not rewarding because it was right. you can have a, have a partner in crime, but sort of the, here's a cool idea, let's talk about it for four or five minutes, was just not possible. And that was, that was what was missing. So for that reason, I was done with math. Another thing I did in that time that also was very important to me, I did an industry source, industry internship um, for Unilever. This was a management internship where we were basically put into mid-level managing positions for six weeks and were trying to figure out what we could do there. Because of my math background, I was put into logistics um, for a sausage company. Um, um, and I found out very quickly the logistics was really easy, sort of optimizing and proving that their production plan was optimized and showing the small places where it was not. I got very good at being playing Minesweeper while doing that. <laughs> um, but at the same time, all the optimization was in the end, how much money comes out at the end. I found that incredibly unrewarding. So I knew very early that optimizing just to make more money was not what I wanted to do. So with that knowledge, after my master's, I started looking around and pretty quickly found out that I wanted to do research. Um, so in Germany, starting a PhD, again, works a little bit different, especially when, when, when I did it. At that point, you didn't have a master's to do a PhD. So this isn't even a possibility because there were, there were no undergrad degrees at the time. There's also no graduate schools. Typically, if you wanted to do a PhD, you went to a professor's office and said, can I do a PhD with you? And the professor said, professor said yes or no, and that was that. I, again, the benefit, I cannot claim any planning. Math and genetics at that point was a really attractive combination. So I went to three or four professors, all in Munich, and they all said yes. So I then had options because they all wanted students, and there were very few students who could do what I could do. Um, so I had options in protein folding, evolutionary modeling, and population genetics. Up to this point, I had never heard about population genetics before. So I tried to figure out what is population genetics. And most of you, at least I probably know, the basic idea of population genetics is that you look at how does genetical principles affect not a single organism, but a whole population. And you can use these types of, and basically you build statistical models. <laughs> you can use these types of statistical models to answer a whole host of questions. Standard question that we like to point out is how did humanity spread across the globe? Right? This is a picture that anybody who had ever looked at genetic data probably knows how humans left Africa about 100,000, more than humans left Africa about 100,000 years ago and spread through the, through the rest of the world over the next period of time. And um, I thought that was incredibly cool. Right? I'd never thought of this idea that. You have genetic, I, I knew what genetic data was. You have genetic data and suddenly you can say something about events that happened 100,000 years ago, right? I thought that was unbelievably cool. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out, population genetics is incredibly mathematical and statistical. The modern founders of population genetics are R.A. Fisher and Sewell Wright. And I think all of you have heard the term likelihood at some point or other, that's the same Fisher, right? So, um, 
they developed the theory that basically made it possible to combine this idea of genetical units as described by Mendel and selection as described by Darwin and show, yeah, this all fits together. You can get all of this together and you can have quantitative traits, which just binary heritable traits. And this is how selection can work in the system. All of these things together, they built the mathematical models for that. And when the cool thing is about population genetics, you have a lot of really, really basic, basic questions about that really go to the core of what, what I think humans could be interested in, right? First and simply, where do we all come from? Um, also, why are we different than chimpanzees? How, how do those big differences happen to occur in a really evolutionary, very short amount of time? How does that fit together with diseases, right? At first blush, natural selection and disease should not exist both at the same time, heritable disease. And how can we understand this knowledge to map disease genes? But that was all about humans, right? You can also use population genetics for a lot of other questions, like where does antibiotic, how does antibiotic resistance spread in a population? Or you can even model cancer growth because fundamentally a cancer is just a population of cells, right? Um, so this was, um, I thought this was cool. I was pretty much taken. So I joined the lab of Arndt von Hasler who was doing population genetics at this time. As I remember how I said earlier that uh, uh, um has um, ass assistant professors. Um, Swan, uh, Anton Hesler was one of those assistant professors, assistant is the German word, to Swarte Pebo. Um, so I was in this Swarte Pebo, who at least already at that point was well famous for doing ancient DNA and had a whole group of other people. Um, so I was basically immediately involved in this large research group that did cutting edge lab science while also having four or five other grad students who did statistical modeling of genetic population genetics. So this was a really great opportunity. One of the really cool things was it also allowed you to allowed me to go very early because it was a reasonably wealthy lab to go to many conferences and really talk to a lot of key people in the field. Um, one of the things that was important for me at this time is actually meeting senior faculty who took whole dinners to talk with me and another grad student and explained to us what they were doing and told us how great our work was, even though it wasn't that great at that time, and um, really encouraged us to move forward in our field and took us seriously as colleagues. Um, so the Svante was, while I was, well, after I joined the lab in Munich, was awarded a directorship of the newly formed Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, which was in Leipzig, so the whole lab moved to Leipzig. Um, for those of you who don't know, Max Planck director is the best job in science anywhere in the world. Um, it is, remember what I said about Lehrstuhl in Harbor, except there's no more teaching attached to it. You're still a professor, you still have funding for multiple assistant professors, for several, for tens or twenties of students and lab assistants permanently without any teaching requirement. So it is, it is an absolute dream job and it's a very uh, coveted job. Um, um, so we all moved to Leipzig and it was an outstanding place. There were a lot of really interesting opportunities. For example, one, um, one weekend, um, so a lot of the things they were looking at was, <laughs> this was also the time when RNA arrays were coming up. So we were among other things interested in expression arrays of, of uh, apes. But the ethos of the lab was not consistent with killing apes for it. So we were always waiting if there was a zoo anywhere in Germany where an ape had died of natural courses. And then we were jetting across Germany to get that uh, body as fast as possible into a, into a cooling box so we could harvest the cells and um, look at their RNA. Um, another thing that made this place super exciting was um, both Swante and Arndt both had dogs. <laughs> and I also got my first dog as an adult there. Um, another friend of mine also had a dog there. So there were, and all of those were full-size dogs. So all that sort of range of 50 pounds and above. Um, so big parts in, and we had three of them were young when they got there. So they were playing in the hallways of this institute pretty much during, during all of the day, there were more than once that you sort of had three dogs, so about 150 pounds of dogs running down a hallway, and everybody stepping out of the way to just protect their knees, right? Because if that much dog runs into your knees, that's not good. Um, 
Okay, at this point, genetics, long time ago, sequencing anything at all was cool. One of my colleagues there, uh, his thesis was fundamentally sequencing 10,000 base pairs in 100 people. And that was nature genetics paper type uh, PhD thesis, right? So um, we were really had relatively limited data. So we used a lot of computer simulation. My work was mostly on simulating uh, linkage disequilibrium and saying, if we believe what we think we know about population, correct population genetic models, what does that tell us about linkage disequilibrium? And for those of you who don't know, linkage disequilibrium is the correlation structure that you have in the genome. So if you think about DNA, DNA gets inherited in chunks, which creates a correlation structure that nearby uh, positions in the genome are correlated. Uh, so my work at that point was fundamentally, how far does that correlation structure go? Um, can we say something about the population based on that correlation structure? And can we use that correlation structure for disease mapping? And my paper, the main paper of my dissertation, fundamentally showed not that easily. Um, it does not extend very far, at least in our simulated, simulated criteria. And you know, we're going to need over 100,000 markers to do good association mapping. Um, that was not a popular conclusion at the time because 100,000 markers was not considered feasible at the time. I got lucky and unlucky that my paper got scooped, or mostly scooped, by Krugliak. Um, some of you might remember that paper. Our papers were actually in parallel in the view at Nature Genetics. Krugliak had modeled expansion at the time I had not, so his paper was chosen. Eight months later, I was at a conference where one of the key speakers spent his entire speaking time tearing Krugliak's paper apart. <laughs> exactly. I was sitting there, I was going, I know Krugliak is right, and I'm not going to say a word. Because <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. Um, I mean, as you probably all know, 100,000 markers is way, well below what we think today that we're going to need. So the papers were still on the optimistic side. Or if we're realistic more, we're saying, well, 20% power is not that bad. <laughs> um, OK, so I had my PhD. I need to decide where to go. And I didn't really know where to go. I didn't really know what. But I figured, well, I'll go to another country for a little bit. Sounds like a good idea. It's an adventure. So I joined Jonathan Pritchard's lab in uh, the University of Chicago. When I agreed to join him, he hadn't even started his position yet. So I arrived there three months after Jonathan. One of the other things you might notice here, I have a Nobel Prize winner and Jonathan Pritchard as my two advisors. I had no idea what I was doing when I chose either one of them. I had no idea of their reputation. I talked to them. I knew they were nice. I knew Jonathan as a, as a postdoc, so I knew I could talk to him and that he was smart. But I got incredibly lucky picking two outstanding um, mentors, one after the other. Uh, my plan to was to go to Chicago for three years. I stayed for three and a half, and I haven't come back to Germany since, as, as you know. Okay, so Brahma pointed out I might probably talk about uh, differences in academic culture, so I will. Um, the language culture between the United States and Germany is very, very different, right? If somebody in German tells you something you did is not bad, yeah. and somebody else tells you this is excellent, the German gave you the better compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> the US, something is excellent if it's not horrible. Um, if it's in the uh, top 70%, you start calling it excellent. Not bad means you're in the top 40%, typically, in, 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 in German culture, right? So making that transition without insulting people all the time was a little bit of a challenge. I was very grateful that Pedro said earlier that I managed to criticize people um, with empathy, because that was work to get there. <laughs> um, there was also another uncanny valley of of of, um, of cultures, because if you come from the U.S. to Germany, it all looks really, really similar at first glance, and then at second glance, it really is not. And there are all these small things where you think you know what you're doing, <laughs> and you get tripped up just enough to frustrate you in that moment, and that is get stressful over and over again. And if we ever sit somewhere with some beer, I'm happy to expound on how that's particularly problematic when you're dating. <laughs> um, another thing that I learned is um, postdocs, and that's unfortunately true in most places, have kind of a weird in-between position in US academia. And actually, it's not better than Germany, right? They belong to 
a specific faculty person who's mostly responsible for everything that they do. There's not a lot of institutional support for them, not like students, because they're not paying tuition or anything like that. So you're often sort of in the situation where the structures for you are not great. In Chicago, side effect for me was I was um, working at the University of Chicago. University you know, of Chicago Hospitals was maybe 100 feet, maybe 200 feet from where I was working. If I needed any medical care, I needed to go to the hospital that was not University of Chicago Hospitals, that was like uh, on the other end of town. Um, another thing that was a very interesting experience was the Ecology and Evolution Journal Club, which was an important part of my academic experience in Chicago, um, which actually had the name Darkness at Noon. It was at Noon. Um, it was on the one hand, academically extremely impressive because they talked about new papers in the domain of ecology and evolution. And you could almost bet one of the people who did the underlying seminal work was in the room, right? It was an unbelievable group of scientists and they in part hated each other's guts. <laughs> so there was not a single talk, a single presentation that a student gave that not at some point a professor started to talk apart, tear apart because it was the work of the other professor. <laughs> it was a, another place where I learned to keep my head down, um, but I learned a lot. Um, on the other hand, the uh, Department of Human Genetics in Chicago, where Jonathan was, and so I was, was very friendly and supportive group. So Nancy Cox, Carol Ober, Anna DiRienzo, Dick Hudson were kind of the key people apart from Jonathan that I was working with. I'm pretty sure Phil with your genetics know all of those names, and those are all excellent people, and they're very nice to help with. The dog situation was not as optimal as it was <laughs> in uh, Leipzig, mostly because Anna Di Rienzo also had a dog, who was about 50% of my, I brought my dog from Germany, in case that needed to be said. Um, who was about 50% larger than my dog, and they were not friends. They did not get along. So she had her dog in her office. I had my dog in my cubicle. And we always scooted. Who's just going? Which dog is just going down the hallway? Okay, then I can move my dog around because once or twice they met each other at the elevator and blah, 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 and a huge barking pit. Um, Nonetheless, Jonathan's group, of course, grew extremely quickly, and there were a couple of outstanding scientists, I'm naming a couple of them here, who were uh, who became friends and colleagues and who were a ton of fun to work with and great to work with. I also made a lot of friends, particularly ecology and evolution, which was also very, very theoretical, um, had a huge international community, German, Ukrainian, from all over the place, who, was, uh, who were great friends. Um, Eventually, though, Jonathan said, you need to find a job. I said, okay. Here it became a little bit of a problem that I had absolutely no idea how the academic system in the U.S. actually works. Right, postdoc, I talked with Jonathan. Jonathan gave me a job. I went to Jonathan. That was my introduction to the academic system. So, okay, I have to get a job. There were so many things I didn't know, and of course I didn't know that I didn't know them, right? In Germany, among other things, universities are on a pretty even playing field, right? They're better and worse, but the difference isn't huge. In the U.S., difference between a third-tier state college and a University of Chicago is like um, ridiculous, and I had no idea, so I applied to both, um, right? Um, that didn't go, but I also didn't understand, like, you want to have your documents out by September, October, the latest. I think I started replying in January. So I did a lot of things that I did not do particularly well, and so it took me about 40 applications to get eight interviews. Um, and then I had three offers. Those were all at very nice places. Um, and uh, as you know, one of them was here. The nice thing, though, about taking that long is that along the process, I could kind of figure out what I wanted. Right? I had this experience with darkness at noon. So I knew I did not I, no. I do not need to have fights with my fellow faculty members all of all. Obviously, if you do any kind of analysis, you need cool data. And the last thing is you're working a lot with students. So you want really good students. And Michigan had all of those things. And so I joined the department in August 2005. Um, unfortunately, nobody had told Laurie that I needed a um, visa. So <laughs> I could not officially join the department in 2005. More brown than because I mean, right? I needed to spend an extra an extra month of salary already. Loaned me a couple of thousand dollars so I could 
expedite my green card. My my no, it was a J1 visa, my visa at the time. So at least an H1B was what was sorry, H1B. So at least in September, I could then actually formally start and get paid. I think it all worked out in the year at the time. <laughs> 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 it's all good and all worked out. Um, as Pedro mentioned, I was on a joint appointment with the psychiatry department. And psychiatry at that point, the genetics of psychiatry was super, super exciting because, as you all know, we still don't really understand the biology of many psychiatric diseases. And we know that they're super, super heritable, right? Psychiatric diseases are much more heritable than most of the other things that we're looking at. So in theory, genetics should be the killer app, right? Genetics should really help us understand what was going on. Turned out not so much. Um, so by now we know that the sample sizes we need for psychiatric diseases are actually probably bigger than for many other traits to really understand what is going on. But still there's some progress now, but it took us well, 18 years or something like mm -hmm. that. Nonetheless, I was able to come in and work with the practice study, which was basically founded at this time, which was uh, Melvin McInnes' brainchild, where he collects bipolar patients and then follows them longitudinally, gets measures of mood and behavior every two months, and of course, genetic data. And at that point, that was very, very exciting, and we're working with that, and Melvin's just an excellent, excellent supportive person. Okay, so... Obviously, coming here, I joined a stellar faculty. Mike and Gonzalo have built a great home for statistics. We had the Center for Statistical Genetics. We had weekly meetings where students were presenting, and I could get an idea what was going on extremely quickly. Um, there was sort of a whole cross-department community for genetics. And I had the also luck that Noah Rosenberg started at the Swiss eminent population geneticist, started at the same time in human genetics. So we had this... Um, outstanding opportunity to work together very quickly. The other side, of course, was I was now in a card-carrying biostatistics department. And remember, my degree was in math. I had one course in statistical gen and mathematical genetics in my entire student year. I did a reading course on sigma star algebra, so I had a basic foundation measurement theory, maybe, which maybe at some point, but that was all the statistics I really knew, except the stuff that I needed in my work. So it was sometimes a little bit scary to interact with faculty. You had this deep, broad understanding of everything statistics. Um, and I was, I'd sometimes it was not that clear whether I should be there or not. Um, but on the other hand, again, there were also quite a few lucky breaks. I applied for my first R01 in 2007. Um, you were just here. It was an RFA for methods for gene environment interaction. It was funded at first try. Um, in 2011, I was asked by Noah Rosenberg and Paul Sheet to join their R01, which they had not got funded the first period. That was my second attempt at an R01. It was also funded the first time. So. Those were, by the way, the only other ones that got funded for a really long time afterwards. But I mean, that was still, that was really nice. I'd also sort of as my last work in Jonathan's lab, worked on the winner's curse and that paper was uh, pretty well received. So I had a pretty good running start as I came in and that made a lot of things uh, much easier. Um, so one of the things one does here is I started teaching and Unsurprisingly, I decided there was no population genetics course here, so I decided to teach population genetics. Um, with Noah Rosenberg, we designed a class together, and we really went through the list. These are all the things we want students that work with us to know. And we designed that class, worked pretty hard on it, and what a breezy class announcement that sort of said all the cool things, understand Neanderthals, understand this. So we got a lot of students, from, it sounded really cool, we got a lot of students from all the departments signing up here. From, uh, from um, epidemiology, from all over the place. Um, the actual class, though, used tools from likelihood, Bayesian inference. There's a lot of advanced combinatorics in population genetics. There were non-trivial different differential equation problems. And our enrollment dropped extremely quickly when people saw class after class. Oh, and here's a new mathematical concept that you also might want to understand to understand what's going on here. So people, uh, the, the class enrollment dropped from 45 students to 10 students within a few weeks. 
And if you ever want to hear more horror stories about the class, I invite you to talk to Matt Zawistowski, who was one of our first students <laughs> there. Um, yeah, another thing that, another blind spot in my education had been that in Svante's lab, there were no outside um, outside big projects because Svante had all the cool data. Um, Jonathan didn't work much with consortia or anything. So I had no experience with any kind of consortium uh, work when I came in. And I also had no appreciation of sort of how you need to keep the balance of the politics going, how you need to be on a lot of conference calls. And I was also not that interested in making myself sound cooler like I was, or maybe even, but I had no interest in selling myself. So there was a lot of opportunities for me to get involved in these projects and I sort of whiffed on pretty much all of them because I just didn't know what to do with them. Instead, I started to work on a lot of smaller projects and sort of small things that I thought were cool. I think some of them were cool and uh, tried to further science that way. Um, okay, also much more important things happened at that time, of course, right? Um, I met my wife, um, Brett and I met 2006 on the internet. For those of you who don't know, um, <laughs> by the time I met, uh, Brett was a PhD student in English and Education here. She graduated sometime afterwards. While she was a student, she founded, founded the SBH Writing Lab. So if you're ever enjoying Kristen's service, you can go and thank my wife. And I was very quickly taken by that she was smart, that she dealt with a lot of adversary both before coming here and honestly, her project was a mess. Uh, not her project, her program was a mess. And um, and she was still incredibly warm. So we married in 2008, because this was over multiple continents. We married multiple times. We did a legal wedding here. We did a church wedding in Germany. And then we did a wedding party here again. Um, all of this was necessary, because in Germany, you can do a church wedding, and the state will not care. But we have said there is. If you want to be actually married, there has to be a state official who puts a sign on it. State, the church person is not a state official, so they cannot actually legally marry you. So we had to do all of these different steps, well, except for the last party. And um, obviously I can't do all of this justice, but it has been amazing over all of these years about how much of a kindred spirit, how easy it is to talk to her. And what I sort of realized a little bit while I was writing this is, um, in many ways, we are very, very different and complementary. And it's kind of interesting that we managed to be both kindred spirits and complementary, which is how that fits together. I, maybe I'll figure out if I give a talk like this again in 20 years, so that's for maybe time. Um, for what was important for my teaching is also that because she focused so much on teaching and um, education, and thought about it in a very theoretical manner that allowed me to re-examine what I was doing as a teacher, what I was doing as a human being, how I was interacting with the people around me, and that I think helped me further broadly my empathy, and particularly how I interacted and thought about students. Um, as I already mentioned before, dogs were a part of my life. And this is Penny, who um, I got in Leipzig, took to Chicago. Yeah. From Chicago, this is actually also Erin, um, from, <laughs> from Chicago, took here with me, and she stayed with me. I had her for 15 years, and she died a couple of years back, quite a while back at this point. But also had a dog, as I said, complimentary. This is Kayla, who she brought into our relationship. Um, and now we have newer dogs, both of our original dogs. By This is Khaleesi, who um, is a little bit bigger now. This is her as a puppy. And then... As sort of a political support animal, we got uh, Patfoot, who um, joined our family a couple of years back. Um, after being married, we did some applied genetics. Um, um, and the result of that, I have two sons. Um, you can admire in the back there, the first one is Aaron, um, who was born in 2010. He's an amazing, inquisitive kid. Um, huge fan of Germany. I think I overdid the pro-Germany thing with him a little bit. <laughs> There's worse. Um, very, if you want to talk for soccer for 
120 minutes or longer, he's exactly your guy. Um, he's very focused on social justice and always has been. My second son is Raphael, which you typically cannot not hear. Um, he's very creative, entertaining, and has all the energy in the world. And with this back to the rest of this talk. Okay, so it turned out um, Michigan was a great academic home. Sort of the hope that I had to avoid the darkness of moon situation totally panned out. Um, it was everybody was willing to help. Um, the staff was also always great and typically willing to do extra miles. And thankfully, also willing to tell you, yeah, no, um, that's asking too much. Um, I managed to make early friends across multiple departments. When you're junior faculty, you're almost closer to postdocs. So many of my early friends were postdocs which then exposed me to some of the downsides of the academic life because none of those postdocs are anywhere near Nava anymore at this point, of course. Um, nice thing was we made new hires pretty quickly. So after a year, I was not the youngest person in the department, any, the most junior person in the department anymore. Um, so that was nice. And the students typically wanted to learn and were a lot of fun to teach. Faculty meetings become less scary, though it was probably three to four years before I regularly said anything in a faculty meeting, which might be... Hard to believe for people who are swimming now in a faculty meeting. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I had many new opportunities, like BDSI from a teaching perspective and PubMed, particularly from a research perspective. Okay, but of course, the coolest part of the job was the students. And this is sort of two class pictures, two, two group pictures of my students of basically two different generations. This was not my idea. Um, I mean, I appreciate it very, very much, but it was not my idea. I was not there, yes. Obviously, you had to put me there. I'm not sure that's me in spirit, too, but I appreciate it. Um, oh, yeah, well, this we can skip on. So I had outstanding students over all the time. And so far, I haven't told you much about the actual research that I've done, primarily because I've always been working with students and working with what the students wanted to do. So a lot of my research has been driven by um, what my students uh, wanted to do. And that gave me sort of, we worked in the direction. So here is my first six PhD students. Um, I'm not sure that's chronologically absolutely correct, as well as their, um, as their, uh, as one of the topics from the dissertation, not necessarily the most important one, but one that fit in here. And as you can see, sort of early work was a lot about rare variants. This is where we were just starting to think about um, what can we do with actual sequencing data. Um, and similarly, sort of imputation comes up again and again as a, as a topic. Um, back and forth, we always move back to uh, coalescent uh, theory. Those of you who do, who don't know, coalescent theory is basically the approach of doing inference and population genetics in a comput computationally efficient ma manner. Um, and it's a relatively complex theory that allows you to model a lot of interesting things. And as you can see, I worked with it. It fundamentally was always the hammer that I reached to when I didn't know what else to do. Um, um, I had, yeah. Yeah, um, the, more recently, I had more outstanding students. My work shifted more to, or their work that I was happy to help with, shifted more towards um, um, more, what well, was actually similarly, this was still variant work. This is also coalescent work. So they were trying to, um, sounds so boring, estimating that the bottlenecks, they were trying to estimate how many uh, mitochondria get transmitted from one generation to the next uh, as a new, as a new germline cell is uh, formed, got some very interesting results. Then more recently, I started to work about germ germline mutation rate, which is worked by uh, worked by Jenna Carlson. As you can see, more recently we've moved into polygenic risk score um, into the space of polygenic risk scores. We've been looking at how can they be um, transferred. Particularly, the main question I've been really interested in is those of you who don't know, polygenic risk scores are the um, are a summary statistic that summarize the genetic risk of a person based on known uh, statistics that have been generated somewhere. The problem is those statistics are generally generally generated in Europeans, which means this measure of risk measures risk in Europeans. Um, 
using the same measure of risk in other populations is quite challenging. And among others, Pedro have worked on this question on how to figure out how can we transfer this measure into a different populations. Um, yeah, and even today, I still have the luxury of working with amazing students. Um, Yichen, of all of these people, has graduated. Um, she has done pretty much amazing work in, in multiple fields. One of them I'm pointing out here is coalescent modeling of imputation. Um, uh, we're still working on polygenic risk or we're still working on uh, mutation rates. And interestingly enough, the last two people who joined my lab have both expressed real interest in ancient DNA. So they wanted to know uh, what can we do interesting things with ancient DNA? How, how can we understand the relationship of Neanderthals and modern humans? So I'm doing ancient DNA again, which is interesting, particularly also in the context of his talks, because as you remember, I started out my lab in the my, my academic life in the lab that started the field of that started much of the field of human ancient DNA. So I'm kind of going a little bit full circle here right now. Okay. Um, as Alicia pointed out, since for the last couple of years, I've been also been working with MGI and Precision Health, MGI and Michigan Genomics Initiative. Um, MGI was founded by Gonzalo in 2012, and in 2017, he became part of Precision Health. And after Gonzalo left, um, Mike Benke took over Gonzalo's role in the leadership of Precision Health and brought me on board as sort of the person who um, looks after MGI, who makes sure MGI is a resource that is as useful as possible. Um, MGI at this point had been mostly, to a big extent, the amount of time that Matt could spare to address people's problems, and that only worked so well. So I managed to, um, or we managed to hire and restructure to actually have a real support staff. And I was incredibly lucky to hire outstanding people for MGI that allowed it to be a much more useful resource to the university. Um, after Mike stepped down, I also took over his role in precision health leadership. And I must say, I enjoy that immensely. Sort of this idea of thinking about possible paths of research and trying to figure out how can I lay the foundation that then other people can use and build upon. I find it unbelievably rewarding, and that's something I, I'm really, really enjoying. And as I've already said, and I'm saying it again, I also thoroughly enjoy working with all the people that um, that are both part of the MTI team and part of Precision Health at large. And how do I do for that? OK, so um, what's next? Um, as of January 1st next year, my I'm split appointment no longer. Um, I will be 100% faculty in biostatistics. That more or less reflects my path where most of my work has been in biostatistics for a while already. And the projects for the genetics of psychiatric disorder in, um, at least in Michigan, have not really coalesced in the way that they should have. Um, my primary focus in the next year or two is going to be on the one hand, um, figuring out how to actually use all the genetic knowledge that we've accumulated over the last decade or so to really help patients. With MGI, we're already in the really, really annoying situation that we have genetic information for our patients. Some of that genetic information directly tells us something a doctor should do. We're not allowed to tell the doctor or the patient. That's ethically... Um, <laughs> That is not a position you want to be in. And so we're right now both trying to figure out how can we jump over that regulatory step, but also once we jump over that regulatory step, how can we actually talk to uh, doctors that they take us seriously, how we can talk to patients that they take us seriously, and how can we figure out how this all works together. Um, the other project that I recently started that's going to keep me busy for a while is the joint analysis of the TopMac project. As you may or may not know, the TopMac project is a very large sequencing project of NHLBI. Um, it's about 160,000 uh, humans with whole genome sequencing. Um, and we have recently started, we have recently generated, of all of those studies that are involved in that, we figured out who are the people who are actually allowed to be analyzed for population genetics. And we're going to start working with that. So that's 100,000 
130,000 whole genome sequences that we're going to start working with. Um, if already just managing that amount of data is a serious challenge, um, but I'm excited to see what's going to happen to it. As I mentioned before, we're moving back to my roots a little bit and trying to figure out ideas to do projects to do in ancient DNA. And as I mentioned before, the cool thing for me about science is talking about it. So I'm looking forward to talking to as many as you about it as possible. With that, I thank you. And here's a list of people I'm particularly thankful for. Lecture was on bad. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'd like to welcome Alicia and thank you, Sebastian. So, uh, to present Sebastian with the certificate of honor for all his contributions to the department, to our community, and to our lives, and uh, also a box of chocolates for the uh, family. And <laughs> And I'm so so thrilled and honored to have you as my colleague. So any any questions for Sudan Sure. After the photo op. <laughs> Good. How come you never have a dog sitting under your in the office? Uh, SPH regulations. <laughs> Go ahead. Did you find scary when you Jeremy, for sure. Um, Rod was scary. <laughs> Some people were not here anymore. I think it's mostly their accents. Um, <laughs> So I, I just want to uh, say one thing that, you know, you mentioned this, that being a, gen a geneticist in a world of statisticians and that identity crisis, but your work, like the conditional likelihood paper, uh, was very statistical, right? So why why did you feel that, like that? Do you still feel that? that, that, that I, I, at this point, I'm feeling entirely relaxed to tell my students, I have no idea how that works, but you learned it in 650 to 651, you should know how that works. <laughs> I, have, I know exactly as much as I need, for example, about regression model, right? I, my knowledge in the areas where I need to know stuff, I have accumulated all the stuff that I need and probably, hopefully, a little bit more than just what I need. But statistics is a huge field. I never got a broad ed education in it. So, right? Every, every year when people ask me which of the basic courses would you be willing to teach, I'm much happier to teach 601 because that's fundamentally there's a lot of math in there. 650, I would be a horrible teacher because I have none of the experience that you need to do that with. Right? So in that sense, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no, right? I think I fit in here. That part I'm not concerned about anymore. But I don't. Yeah, it takes a while to get comfortable with yeah. your skin. Yes, Lauren, please. So when you listen to talks like now, if you weren't in the field that you were concentrated, you know, on the, the population genetics, what what is it that you, you listen to sometimes and you go, oh that's cool? That depends a lot. Um Sometimes it's just sort of a trick, right? They have a complicated problem and then they move it half a step and suddenly it becomes super easy. And that's just, that's always, that's a like mind goal, right? Um, and that can be entirely independent to um, the last talk that I thought that school was at ASHG and I'm old, so I already have tried to remember what it was about. Um, Oh yeah, that was about, uh, and sometimes it's biology, right? Um, this was about uh, the maintenance of recombination hotspots. I don't know if you saw Simon Meyer's talk at ASHG. That totally blew me away because there were so many interesting next steps. What does that tell us about evolution? What does it tell us about speciation, right? There's sort of, you get this whole catalog of, oh, I want to know that, and I want to know that, and I want to know that, and I already have half an idea how I can find this out, and so on. But if you sort of, you see sort of this, 
this door open and there's this whole landscape of opportunity behind it. That's that's the thing that get me excited most of the time. Did you expect your advisor to get Nobel Prize? Like when you're the conversation was ongoing for a while. So, and I mean, is that got Nobel Prize? I guess we know that's predictive, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is there anything you wish you did differently along your journey? I mean, the being a little bit smarter about how to deal with consortia would have made my life easier in some places, right? Because you get into a lot of cool projects, but you basically have to grind it out for a couple of years before you actually have something where you get to move and shake. I didn't understand that. I there was um, so there's 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 more smaller things that I certainly could have could have done. Yeah. Other questions? Have you ever driven a car to campus? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. There were days when it was raining cats and dogs, and I needed to be on campus, especially pre uh, pandemic. Post pandemic, I'd probably be more comfortable just moving everything online rather than drive. But pre pandemic, I certainly sometimes just needed to be here, and it was. I did not want to arrive all drenched. Yes, I've been amazed uh, at the the conditions uh, with which you are willing to ride your bike. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a story. <laughs> there's a story there. I bought my first car um, after I moved to Chicago. So before, in both in Munich and in Leipzig, everything that needed to be done, I could do by bike or a cab once in a year. Um, my sister happened to be here uh, while I was buying the car, and I was sort of looking out at anything, but I picked up this Ford Escort through an ad, and she said, Ford Escort, why don't you buy a small car? And then we went there, and she looked around, she looked at the car and said, oh, I get it, you're driving, you're buying a small car. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because by a German standards, not a small car, by US standards, not particularly big. <laughs> Other questions? You listed your hobbies. You didn't talk about them. Do you still have those hobbies? Skiing, pretty much. Um, pretty much. Yeah. No downhill skiing. Not 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 uh, cross country once in a while, but primarily downhill skiing. Yes. Hobbies have been surprisingly constant. The only thing that sort of made a major appearance in Chicago was rock climbing, but that kind of petered away when I came back here. My primary hobbies. My primary hobbies would probably still be my family and my dogs, but the other hobbies are still all around. Is there any research question that you've always wanted to deal with, but you've never done it? Yes, there's a research question that I've always been curious about. I have no idea how to do it, if you could even do it. I've always been curious if you could figure out how much of a barrier to migration that then involves. Yeah. Right? Because you have a pretty good idea when it comes up, and you should see sort of Old coalescent events uh, before that time be pretty normal, and then suddenly the rate needs would go go down a lot. So if you could sort of sequence large samples on both sides, that would be a cool question, right? Because it also tells us something about how much do we actually have control of our destiny as humans, or how much in the long run what we do doesn't matter much. <laughs> as I said, no idea if that's even doable. But it's a question that I sometimes wonder about. I really should know. I mean, what, what we could do, what is doable is you could figure out which sample sizes would I need and how would the patterns look like. And by theoretically simulating it or go, going through the steps, what would this look like assuming the migration went down by X? That's that's not particularly challenging. Uh, getting the data and analyzing it, that's what yeah. <laughs> And figuring out how to sample the data the right way, all these kind of things, right? Because I don't know how much recent migration in the last hundred years is sort of, and if there's a ton of migration in the last hundred years, it becomes trickier to figure out how exactly do we get the people they're trying to get people. But right? old population genetic sampling strategies had a lot of, they sampled you, but only if your grandparents lived in the same place, all four grandparents lived in the same place where you were living. To make sure that you're not a recent migrant into the area because then you're not very representative of that area. 
So also the the the, the connection questions are harder than the actual than the actual analysis questions there. But is that going to change population genetics in the future? Now we we're going to be much more. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, no, absolutely. Right. I mean, if you take people, if you take people who are, uh, and I mean, people moved much more for the last five hundred years, for the last four or five hundred years, right? People, I think I don't think the difference between a hundred years ago and today is going to matter that much. But uh, but the difference, right? I mean, just need to look at most anybody admixed in the Americas. You would not have people of that genetic pattern without large scale, long distance population migration in very short amount of time. But before before modern times was all dispersal. What's your favorite soccer team? <laughs> I'm boring. <laughs> In this context, at least. Go ahead. What do you feel has been your biggest change in the in your immigrant journey? Oh, that's. <laughs> I mean, I'm technically still not. I'm not American citizen. I'm still a German citizen with a green card here. So my immigrant journey is not completed as as of such. Um, getting married here. I mean, getting married, starting a family here. Again, not the most the most surprising answer, but that really that's where you start to really have to live in a new place. Right? Be, so, for example, U.S. high schools, as you all know, are a big cultural trope. Um, <laughs> if you live in Germany, they are a big cultural trope from another planet. Right, so, but now they are, are moving from a big cultural trope to a reality from, not for me personally, obviously, but for my kids. And so that's sort of the, I think that might be an answer to your question. If you ask me today, then I'd give you a different answer because I haven't thought about this. <laughs> so as most of you know, that the journey lectures are our way of honoring our colleagues. Uh, but also, there are many members in this room whose journey Sebastian life has uh, Sebastian has touched. So I'd like to invite all Sebastian's trainees and his family and the applied genetics examples uh, to, <laughs> to come over for a photo and for all of us to honor them with a big applause. So please, if you're Sebastian's trainees and also Brett, please. Uh, I have had the pleasure of working with Brett um, on BDSI, and she's an incredible human and teacher. Uh, so we are very thankful for Sebastian, but I personally am very thankful for Brett and her contribution to the undergraduate summer program, the way she actually teaches the summer program students about writing and growing their confidence is incredible. Each year we get tremendous reviews about Brett as well. Uh, so. Here is a moment, and you know we are doing all kind of technical work, but ultimately it's the people. So let us give a big applause. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I hope to see many of you at the holiday party tomorrow, eleven to one, Michigan. <laughs> Can I get a picture of Thank you. Thank you.